They are coming! Countdown to IFT3. Starship Orbital Tank Farm expansion begins. New sign at the launch site. Starship at LC39A cancelled. ULA hits another huge milestone and Firefly is about to launch another rocket. My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's dive right in. Starship Updates Just two weeks ago we witnessed a monumental event in SpaceX history. The largest rocket of all time, Starship, soared into the skies, propelling the program to new heights. And now we're already counting down to the next Starship flight. Although this launch resulted in less damage to the launch complex than the previous attempt, essential repairs are still needed. SpaceX's engineering team is focusing on these fixes, with the orbital launch mount's restoration being a top priority. This is crucial, as the mount is essential for testing the Super Heavy booster designated for the third Starship launch. Starting at the base, our expert camera operator John recently observed numerous cracks on the table's legs, each clearly marked by the workers. These legs are metal casings filled with concrete to enhance stability, so a small crack here and there is likely not a huge deal. Despite this, we've already noticed workers filling some of these cracks with new welds. Once all the cracks are repaired, we anticipate a fresh coat of paint over the entire table, restoring it to a like new condition. Higher up, we find the critical booster quick disconnect. This component is a retractable plate, equipped with multiple connections that supply propellant, fuel, data and electricity to the super heavy booster. Just milliseconds before liftoff, this plate detaches from the booster and is shielded by a unique cover. This mechanism reminds me of the design used in the Saturn V rocket. The tail service mast, which delivered propellant, also retreated behind a blast shield at liftoff. This simple yet genius solution effectively protects the quick disconnect from the intense forces and heat of liftoff. Despite the mechanism performing perfectly during liftoff, the panel still ended up coated in soot. However, recently workers cleaned it up, and now it looks like new, with no visible damage at first sight. We are likely to witness a retraction test of the BQD in the coming days. Moving up, the Mechazilla arms, also known as the chopsticks, have been undergoing inspections by engineers. These arms are expected to be put into action again soon, this time to lift Booster 10 as part of its ongoing test campaign. There is still work to be done on the ship quick disconnect arm which hasn't been repaired yet and remains in a downward facing position, likely due to a dislodged actuator damaged by the launch. Significant activity has also been observed at the heart of the launch site, the orbital tank farm. Here we've noticed some pipes marked with red X's being removed, particularly on the methane side of the farm. This could be a part of the ongoing modernization work, which began a few months ago by installing additional subcoolers and new pumps for both liquid oxygen and methane. These upgrades are expected to significantly reduce the time required to fully fuel the Starship stack. Currently it takes about 90 minutes, but this time might be cut in half in the future. The replacement of old pipes and the arrival of new ones could also tie into another exciting development. Remember the mysterious tank pedestals we've been speculating about for months? On November 27th, the first tank destined for these pedestals made a surprise entrance into Starbase. Surprise! It was definitely an unexpected delivery, having gone unnoticed until it was practically at the launch complex. Carried on a massive 26 axle SPM transporter, the tank was swiftly placed onto the pedestals closest to the existing tanks on the same day. SpaceX isn't messing around, the pace is as quick as ever. In less than a day following the arrival of the first cryogenic tank, a second one was delivered and swiftly positioned. And work didn't slow down there, merely three hours after the installation of the second, a third one arrived at the gate of the launch complex. Crazy. At the time of recording this episode, no additional tanks had been delivered, but it is entirely possible that the tank farm has already expanded by the time you're watching this. Now you might be wondering, Felix, what are these tanks for? The exact purpose remains unclear, as there have yet to be definitive indicators. 
However, it is possible that they could be used for liquid oxygen storage, given how much volume the current tank farm uses just for that. This move might suggest a transition from the currently used vertical tanks, which have sustained considerable wear and tear through just two launches. While they can be repaired, the shells will eventually need replacing, and we haven't seen any sign of SpaceX preparing to restart their production. One concern with these new tanks being designated for oxygen storage is their proximity to the methane tanks. In the event of a catastrophic failure where both are ruptured, let's say during a failed ship catch attempt, the consequences could be disastrous. <laughs> We could see a wall between the old and new tanks or a full-blown metal reinforced shield to mitigate such risks. There is an interesting alternative to this, but to fully grasp it we must visit Florida's Launch Complex 39A, the primary site for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launches. In 2022, SpaceX ramped up the transformation of a section of this facility to support Starship operations. This led to the construction of a new launch pad, complete with a launch tower and shorter Mechazilla arms. Progress at LC-39A even included the installation of a deluge system. However, parts of this system were later dismantled and transported to Starbase contributing to the new water deflector setup there. Rather than building an entirely new tank farm as in Texas, SpaceX opted to repurpose existing infrastructure at LC-39A, some of which dates back to the Apollo era. This includes two large methane spheres, one initially used for liquid hydrogen storage and the other for liquid oxygen. The hydrogen sphere was modified for methane storage and now there is speculation that SpaceX might relocate this sphere to Starbase as well. I know how this sounds, but hear me out. Such a move would likely necessitate the removal of some or all of the vertical tanks at Starbase to accommodate the sphere. Still, it would significantly enhance the orbital tank farm's capacity. There are a few challenges accompanying this theory. Firstly, transporting such a large tank would be one hell of a task. Even getting it to the port of Brownsville could be challenging, not to mention maneuvering it down Highway 4, which is only about 12 meters or 39 feet wide, while the sphere's widest point is nearly double that. Additionally, there is the question if such a tank is even needed. SpaceX's current methane storage capacity at Starbase is already sufficient for a full Starship launch. Incorporating this sphere could potentially end the need for refueling after a failed launch attempt. It would be also helpful for the second launch tower, which at this point seems inevitable. Not to mention that replacing the vertical tanks with an equally huge object doesn't seem like a smart move when moving to horizontal storage. For the moment, the theory of moving the methane sphere to Starbase seems far-fetched, but SpaceX's history of unexpected moves means we can't entirely rule it out. I wouldn't be shocked if one day a giant 22-meter or 70-foot ball were to suddenly appear at Starbase. What are your thoughts on this? Is transporting such a massive object in one piece even doable? What is your fix for SpaceX's tank farm setup? Share your opinions in the comments. The concept of cancelling Starship work at LC-39A itself is not as implausible as it might initially seem, especially given the ever-evolving nature of Starbase. Here, changes to the infrastructure like the tank farm, the launch table, or the tower are not uncommon. In contrast, LC-39A is a bustling hub for Falcon 9 and sometimes Falcon Heavy launches. The regular launch schedule would constrain any significant modifications to LC-39A or result in disrupted missions. Given that the second Starship flight did not achieve orbit, it seems unlikely that NASA would promptly authorize SpaceX to go ahead and launch launch Starship from LC-39A. As a result, SpaceX might prioritize constructing a second tower at Starbase, potentially using some components from Florida. This way, they could wait for the Starship design to mature so that launches wouldn't risk interrupting Falcon operations at LC-39A. Although the new tower is expected to originate from Roberts Road and not from LC-39A, it is possible that the launch table from Florida might eventually be moved to Starbase to accelerate the process. We also have to remember how much damage only the shockwaves from the second Starship launch did to the tank farm. 
LC-39A is as close to the Starship mount as the tank farm to the OLM at Starbase. Blast shields might be needed. One intriguing alternative for SpaceX rather than upgrading LC-39A is to focus on developing a dedicated launch pad known as LC-49. Information about this potential site is almost non-existent, but we know that SpaceX has been considering it for some time. LC-49 would be a great choice, considering the potential risks associated with Starship launches. Should a worst-case scenario occur and Starship explodes at LC-49, Falcon and Dragon operations at LC-39A would remain unaffected, keeping NASA happy. At this time, all of this is pure speculation, and we'll have to wait patiently to see what happens. But mark my words, LC-39A for Starships is getting less and less likely. Speaking of restoration and protection efforts, we are all not getting younger, right? I want to share with you how today's sponsor, AG1, has boosted my energy and focus while supporting my gut and immune system. Balancing my body's nutritional needs isn't easy amid video creation and family time. So I drink AG1's foundational nutritional supplement before I start my day exploring the stars. At home or on the go, it is easy to use. Mix it with water or your favorite juice, give it a shake and enjoy. It supports my microbiome with pre and probiotics and digestive enzymes that aid digestion and nutrient absorption. My stomach is happier with less bloat, and the replenishment of micronutrients helps provide me with an energy boost. Join me in my pursuit of better health. Go to drinkag1.com slash whataboutit to get a free one year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. In a busy life, AG1 simplifies healthy habits and supports daily nutrition. No more juggling supplements, let's prioritize our health together. That's drinkag1.com slash whataboutit for a free one year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Thank you AG1 for setting out to pioneer foundational nutrition. Shifting our focus to the suborbital site, there is noticeable progress on constructing the surrounding wall. The good news is that the wall may be smaller than initially anticipated, allowing us to maintain some visibility of the launch site. Yes! A section of that wall had recently been painted and then something surprising happened. On November 28th, workers began adding letters to it. With arse already in place? Come on, not what you think. The completed message will probably read Gateway to Mars, a fitting and inspirational tagline for the site. Starbase is getting more and more pretty. Now let's turn our attention to the build site, where the third orbital starship is nearing completion. Yeah, you heard me right, it is hard to say how long it will take, but it is safe to say that we are already very close to a third launch if bureaucracy doesn't interfere. Over at the high bay, Ship 28 is having its heat tiles installed, with most already in place since its arrival. The mounting points for the lifting squid are still visible, but their removal will strongly indicate that the rollout is close. Booster 10 is also preparing for its rollout, though the timeline depends on the extent of repairs needed at the orbital launch table. As per FCC filings, one exciting aspect of the upcoming third Starship flight is that it will feature telemetry and video retrieval using the Starlink constellation. During the second Starship launch, SpaceX also tried out this system. However, no footage from onboard cameras has been released despite this. This either means that SpaceX is cooking something special for us, or perhaps the Starlink connection was just unsuccessful. I mention this because the FCC recently issued a license that permits this type of connection for the third Starship mission. The license is valid from December 1st, 2023 to June 1st, 2024. As is often the case with this license, this news ignited speculation suggesting that this time frame could indicate the launch window for the next Starship flight. However, I must clarify again that this FCC license is only for using specific frequencies during the flight and doesn't directly correlate with the launch date. That doesn't mean we can't play a guessing game, so leave your predicted launch date in the comments. I'm still going with February, which would be so close already. 
Now would be a great time to hit the like button and consider becoming a Y supporter for exclusive SpaceX updates. With it, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, now including orbital, aerial, and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. No matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access. You decide what you want to give. Check our new website as well, launch previews, road closures, the latest weather report and our multi-stream viewer whataboutit.space. The link to our Patreon page and the new website is in the description. Thanks to all the supporters who help fulfill dreams for our team. We can't thank you enough. You rock. Going back to the news, the space community recently mourned the loss of a prominent figure, Steve Yurchik, who had a long and distinguished career at NASA. And there is a very special reason why I mention him today. After obtaining his Master of Science in Electrical Engineering, Yurchik joined NASA's Langley Research Center in 1988. He started as a testing engineer and eventually became the facility's lead director, significantly contributing to the development of technologies for solar system exploration. In May 2018, Yurchik scored one of the most significant achievements of his career by becoming NASA's Associate Administrator the highest ranking civil servant role within the agency. You cannot get higher than that without being chosen directly by the President of the United States. Thanks to his work experience, Yurchik was chosen as acting administrator of NASA following Jim Bridenstine's departure in January 2021. His time in this role was short but impactful. During this period, he presided over significant milestones, including the successful landing of the Mars rover Perseverance and the Crew-1 and 2 rotation. We, the Starship enthusiasts, should have a special place for Steve in our hearts, as he was the one who advocated for SpaceX as the primary contractor for the Human Landing System program. This decision, while at that time controversial and leading to legal challenges, demonstrated his commitment to innovation and progress in space exploration. Sadly, Steve Yurchik passed away on November 23rd at the age of 61 after a brave battle with pancreatic cancer. His loss is deeply felt in the space community, but his contributions to NASA and space exploration leave a lasting impact. We honor his memory and extend our deepest condolences to his loved ones. Rest in peace, Steve Yurchik. That first Starship landing on the moon will be for you. Shifting to a more upbeat note, exciting developments unfold with ULA's Vulcan Centaur, a rocket designed to succeed both the Atlas V and Delta IV Heavy. This next generation launcher has experienced its share of challenges. Most notably the setback caused by a second stage leak that led to an explosion during tests at the Marshall Space Center. However, following months of repair work, the refurbished Centaur 5 stage was recently transported to Space Launch Complex 41 here in Florida. On November 19th, it was carefully stacked atop the Vulcan booster, allowing ULA to continue the certification Flight 1 campaign. With the Vulcan now assembled, it is poised to undergo a series of tests and quality checks. One key test on the horizon is the wet dress rehearsal. Similarly to Starship testing, this procedure involves fully fueling the tanks of both the upper and booster stages and simulating a launch countdown minus the actual engine ignition. Assuming that the wet dress rehearsal proceeds without a hitch, the next step for Vulcan Centaur will involve rolling it back to the vertical integration facility for payload integration. As you can see, there is not much left before the inaugural launch, which remains slated for December 24th. That's this month. I can't wait to see this thing launch. What a Christmas gift from ULA. And after that inaugural launch, after a successful first flight, Vulcan Centaur must complete a second certification mission. The rocket will deliver Sierra Space's Dream Chaser to the International Space Station this time. Success in these two initial missions is needed for Vulcan to be deemed fit for handling national security contracts for the US government. Additionally, ULA has recently celebrated a significant milestone. 60 years of collaboration with Aerojet Rocketdyne, the creators of the legendary RL-10 engine. 
While Vulcan's first stage is powered by the brand new BE4 engines, its Centaur upper stage continues to rely on the proven performance of the RL10. This well-known and reliable engine has a rich history, having been a critical component of various significant space missions. Initially used in the 1960s on the first Atlas rockets, it also powered the now-retired Delta IV and the Space Launch System. It even flew on the mini starship known as Delta Clipper. As the first hydrogen-powered rocket engine developed in the US, it is impressive that it's still being used for in-space propulsion a massive 60 years later. However, just because it works doesn't mean it's not getting any upgrades. ULA plans to use the upgraded version of RL-10, known as RL-10CX, around 2025. Last year, they placed an order for 116 units of these engines, so they are pretty confident in its design. The main change in the newest revision is that more of it is produced using additive manufacturing. Simply put, its thrust chamber will be 3D printed to save cost and improve its performance. I look forward to seeing the upgraded RL-10 tested on actual flight hardware. Lastly, let's check out the upcoming exciting activities from another newcomer, Firefly Aerospace. Following a less than ideal second launch of their Alpha rocket, the company paused all launch operations for nearly a year. Since then, they made a remarkable comeback with the successful launch of the tactically responsive Space 3 mission. They had only 24 hours to integrate the payload and launch the rocket, yet they managed to do it. Fantastic job! Firefly is now getting ready for not just one, but two upcoming missions. The first, named Fly the Lightning, will deploy Lockheed Martin's ESA satellite. ESA as in European Space Agency? No, as in electronically steerable antenna. This innovative antenna technology promises quicker calibration than traditional satellite sensors, saving money and time for the company's clients. The Alpha rocket designated for this mission is already on the launch pad, with the liftoff anticipated later this month, though the specific window remains to be confirmed. Simultaneously, Firefly is also preparing for its fifth launch to deliver NASA's Elena 43 payload. The Educational Launch of Nanosatellites Initiative allows many US universities to launch their own satellites. While the launch window for Elena 43 isn't yet defined, it is likely to occur within the first quarter of 2024. Firefly's recent approach to missions is promising. I'm hopeful they will be able to follow Rocket Lab's success, achieving a high frequency of launches and becoming a significant player in the aerospace industry, fingers crossed. That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button, subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. A link is in the description. And if you want to train your space IQ even further, watch this video you next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. <laughs> the launch table from, from Florida when moving to horizontal Yes, operating. No, have faith. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, come on.